Well, welcome all. Um, I guess all of you know that this is a meeting of the Weston Price uh, Central Vermont chapter, and I've, everyone now knows what that means, so I guess I don't have to reiterate. Um, if anyone would like to, there are strips of paper back there. Uh, you're welcome to jot your name on it and drop it in a stat bucket. We're going to have a drawing for one of the last two uh, Weston Price journals that came out. And then if you want to sign up for it anyways, at the end of the year I'm going to keep collecting names um, and then draw for a free Weston Price membership for a year at the end of this year as well. Um, so Alex, Dr. Alex Eingorn is joining us tonight and has nicely agreed to chat with us about his stress management and resiliency tools um, that he facilitated a training kind of program, maybe you could say, for his patients when he had his practice in New York City. And so I'm really excited about learning because I can grow a lot in this area myself. So thank you. For thank being you. Here. He'll give his presentation and then open up for some Q&A. Sure. All right. So uh, let me just get this started here. So uh, yeah, thanks for coming. and. My name is Alex Eingorn. I am a retired chiropractor. I practiced in New York City for 36 years in Midtown. And uh, you probably can imagine that's a very stressful thing to do and a very stressful place to live. Um, where am I here? It's, uh, oh, there you go. And, you know, my interest in stress management goes back to my childhood because I've had a pretty you know dicey life from the get-go I was born and raised in communist Russia uh, then I lived in the Middle East uh, through a war and then in the US you know uh, we came to this country with one suit three suitcases and $100 uh, so it's been a very interesting experience, you know, and I, I've seen and experienced horrible things that people do to each other. And yet, you know, my faith in humanity has not shaken. But, you know, to help me kind of make sense of this and, and keep myself together throughout the years, you know, I'm always interested in, you know, how do you manage? stress uh, without making sick, uh, making you sick. And we know today that stress is a very big topic. You know, um, there's high rates of suicide, there's high rates of drug abuse. A lot of people manage stress through self-medication, for example, drugs and alcohol, uh, just because they don't know how to, uh, how to manage stress properly and stress can kill you. Uh, we all know that. I mean, life here in Vermont is a lot different <laughs> than in, uh, uh, you know, in, in the flatlands, as, as some people say here. Uh, and, um, but I'm sure everybody experiences stress differently in, in, in very personal ways. Uh, for example, uh, I'll give you a, an interesting story from my practice. There was this, uh, actually it was, a, it was in the literature, there was a a woman who had all kinds of issues throughout her life, you know, from, you know, attempted suicide and drug abuse and depression and anxiety and all kinds of... And eventually she did find a, a therapist that kind of solved her issue by discovering that when she was five years old, she went to a fair with her mother and her little sister and her ma she did something that made her mother mad and her mother bought a lollipop for her sister but not for her. And that affected her so much that for, for a number of decades she actually was traumatized. So we all experience trauma in very different ways. Okay, and I, I've, I've met people that, you know, went through battlefields and came out pretty much unscathed, you know, and, and stronger than they, they were. So. What we're going to talk to today about is, um, and what I found interesting is, is at a certain point I wound up um, studying this, this program at Harvard 
and they call it the SMART program, and it was uh, founded by the Benson Henry Institute, which is affiliated with uh, Mass General. And they did a lot of research in, in how the body works under stress and what can we do to uh, counteract the effects of stress and, and stay healthy and prevent, uh, you know, falling into stress-related disorders. And stress-related disorders, the list is, goes on and on. It, it's high blood pressure, diabetes, you know, depression, anxiety, uh, digestive problems, uh, even some forms of autoimmune disease are, are caused by stress. So, uh, and they did a lot of research actually with uh, Tibetan monks and the way they meditate and they've studied the way uh, their brain waves, for example, and because these guys, they can sit in the snow in wet sheets and meditate and the sheets become dry and they don't freeze. So the brain is an amazing organ, you know, uh, you know, most people think the brain is a blob on a stick. It really isn't. It's, it's a really strong muscle and if you exercise it properly, uh, it can give you some really good benefits. So um, we're going to, I made this little presentation about stress and this whole program. And I used to teach this program. Uh, it's really like an eight week course. So I'm going to try and condense the, the, uh, the nuts and bolts of it into an hour or so. Uh, and I hope and I'm convinced that at the end of this session today, that every single one of you is going to walk away with something that you will find very useful and you can actually use right away to, to help you with uh, all kinds of uh, stress mitigation in your situations, right? So um, what is stress? And they define it, is that in focus? Let me just make sure it's a little, let me see if that's, can everyone see this? I, I, that's like the only, can you read it? Stress is trying to get that focus. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Well, I think it's maybe as good as it's going to get. Think it's just the lighting conditions. Yeah, so I'll, I'll read it. Stress is what the brain does to itself and other parts of the body when a stressor is perceived as a separation threat, a challenge, or even an attachment opportunity. So that's how they define stress. So, uh, Little babies get stressed when they separate from the mothers, for example. That's, that's a stress. And they go through a complete biochemical process in their bodies. And it's also it's defined as a sense of threat to physical and, and or emotional well-being and the belief that one is not capable of coping with the threat. That's really how stress is defined. And it actually includes both negative and positive events. Okay, so sometimes a positive event can cause a lot of stress. Like, ever try to plan a wedding, right? <laughs> and that's called eustress. Okay, the body processes it in the same way, and it can cause actually really negative reactions if you don't know how to mitigate that. So, ac acute stress is adaptive. You know, you hear a loud noise somewhere, boom, it startles you and you kind of process it and you, you adapt and you move on. It doesn't really affect you in, 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 in a profound way unless it just keeps repeating itself. <laughs> and then um, chronic stress prolonged and, is, and maladaptive, it continues to medical and mental illness. And uh, we all know that. You know, people under chronic stress will get sick, both physically and mentally. And the stress response is controlled by an area of the brain, two areas actually, by prefrontal co cortex that is kind of a more of a logical decision-making uh, area, and the amygdala, which is deeper back in. And the amygdala is probably the most ancient part of our brain. Okay, the amygdala triggers what we call the fight or flight response. And today we actually call it the fight, flight, or freeze response. Okay, and that, you know, some people actually live in a constant state of fight or flight response. Their adrenal glands just keep making their adrenaline and they're always stressed and they get high blood pressure and they go and they get high blood pressure medication and, you know, and it actually eventually fails. 
because the cause of stress is not removed. So it's really important <coughs> for us to kind of understand what stress is and how it affects us. So uh, moving on, um, okay, stress response in the body typically will include the following events. Your heart rate will increase, right? Your blood pressure will rise. We all know that, right? Uh, cholesterol levels will go up because you need to make cortisol and cortisol is made from cholesterol. So is adrenaline. So, and you know, the whole thing with the cholesterol being an enemy and the, the American Heart Association saying, oh, eat margarine because cholesterol will kill you. That was such a, I don't even want to say what it was, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because we can't survive without cholesterol. Every single hormone and, and a lot of neurotrans neurotransmitters in the body I made from cholesterol. However, uh, and whatever cholesterol you eat is going to get broken down anyway, and your body is going to make its own. But in response to stress, the body makes so much cholesterol that it can't really use it all. It settles on your arteries and, and causes our cardiovascular disease or arterial disease or venous disease, okay? So uh, under stress, the immune system is less effective because it becomes overwhelmed. So we don't fight colds and, and flus and that kind of stuff. We don't heal as well when we're under stress. And we, we all need to understand that and kind of mentally check ourselves periodically that, yeah, that's how it affects me if you're stressed. So, you know, and to be mindful if you are stressed. So, uh, the sense of well-being decreases when you're under stress, uh, right? You all know this, right? The sleep is disrupted, irritability is increased, uh, and, you know, if irritability increase, increases, you know, enough, people go through things like road rage, and do, they do socially unacceptable things. Right? I mean, normal people under, that, are, that are healthy, you know, they can deal with stuff, right? And people that are stressed, they can't. And then digestion works less efficiently. And we all know that irritable bowel syndrome, ulcers, you know, and, and, and the such, even stomach cancers can be caused by stress. Okay? So, uh, are you with me so far? All right. So, um, so I, I'm just going to ask you a couple, of, like, what do you consider stressful? I'm curious. Well, you mentioned positive stress. Well, what a day we had today. The water quit. Creamy customers are coming in. Creamy machine can't be used. I mean, it's positive. People are coming here, happy to be here, but trying to um, pretend nothing's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> And tempt them with samples of syrup and make them happy regardless, even though we can't give them. It's all good, but it's stressful. Good. Okay, well, you know, you make, a, make an impression of a person who's completely adapted to dealing with stress, which is good. Like, and what about you, for example? Well, I've been uh, writing this book for the past two years. And I wanted to publish it in May. And uh, I keep telling the wife, you know, finish reading the book, you know, give me some feedback, you know, and she always has something better to do instead of that, and uh, that's my current stress. And that stresses you out. Oh, yeah. Do you lose sleep over that? Oh, yes, sure. Okay. Of course, and loss of sleep can actually lead to physical illness, so keep that in mind. Uh, how about you? I don't know what I can say about it. I mean, I'm yeah. trying to lessen my stress of my expectations. Because I look out and I say, there's all these things to do on my honey-do list. And then I go, there's only one of me, and there's too many of that. And it's weather control, and I go, well, I guess it wasn't meant to be today. So I try to detox myself. Good for you. Over stress, stress. But every now and then I get into the mode of, wow, what's going on in the world, and how we're being bamboozled, and that stress. And then I go out and I just go, it's time to get out, watch the butterflies, and the... Uh, nature's little, uh, you know, the little, I, I just love it, you know, being outdoors. Yeah. I just go out and go for a walk and well, stress that. Well, that there is actually, there are scientific studies that show yeah. that a walk in nature, oh, even watching, like, nature on the screen, 
is very, very healthy and, and, and relieves a lot of stress. In Japan, <coughs> they have this thing called a shindoku, which literally means forest bathing where they go in the forest and they just bathe in the, in the energy of, the, of nature. And it's a most wonderful ritual, you know. So, um, anyone else want to talk about what they consider stressful? How about you, John? Uh, work. Work. <laughs> My business partner's gone for six weeks, so Dang. I have to take on a little bit extra. So that's the stressful thing right now. But it's, uh, I think le leading up to it was more stressful than actually during. So it's, it's You're talking about expectations, right? Yeah. Okay. So. All right. And Marilyn? Mm, I think I relate to the so many things get it done, not enough time in the day to get it done. Uh -huh. Okay. And? Um, let's see. What's stressful? I have young adult children and sometimes navigating that new relationship of you know things are different but i still want to make sure everything's okay and we sort of have to deal with that it can be a little stressful mm, trying to control everything is really hard too right <laughs> yeah <laughs> So I try to go out and enjoy the beauty of what's around us. Just be thankful for that. Just kind of okay. Decompress, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So they have a designed a, a stress scale at Harvard, and in terms of ranking, from zero to a hundred. So there it is. If you can read it, you know, good. If you can't, I can read it to you quickly. So number one is a hundred. On, of the stress value on a, on a stress scale of life events is a death of a spouse or a life partner. 100% uh, stressful, okay? Divorce, 73% stressful. It's almost as, as horrible as death, apparently. <laughs> um, marital separation, 65%, okay? Because it's not as final as divorce. There's still hope. Um, Detention in jail is only 63% stressful. Can you imagine? No. Yeah, right? Uh, major personal illness or injury, 53%. Um, I am very intimately familiar with that. I had many injuries and been to hell and back a few times. So, yeah, but it's only 53%. <laughs> Marriage, <laughs> 50%. <laughs> okay, so yeah, read the small print. <laughs> before you sign that, <laughs> that certificate. <laughs> um, getting fired, 47%. Uh, marital reconciliation is actually 45% on the stress scale. Retirement, 45%. Um, I'm going through that right now, so I'm trying to mitigate the stress of retirement <laughs> by keeping bees and <laughs> and stacking, stacking wood, making sourdough bread, yeah. And <coughs> change in family members' health. So when someone close to you gets sick and you become a caretaker or anything else, that is a 44% uh, stress scale. Buying a house would be on that list. Very Clearly it isn't. <coughs> so, but you know, I mean, this is only one reference. So here we go. Uh, this is a little bit of a... a demonstration of uh, the brain and the prefrontal cortex is right here right it's a big green area and the amygdala is right here right so there are two ways that things can work on the brain okay and, and we, we call it either bottom-up or top-down thinking okay the the, the bottom-up thinking is that there is a stressor the amygdala says, dang, it's, it's, it, there's danger. You know, start releasing all these, all these chemicals that cause all these things we just mentioned, right? And then the prefrontal cortex is the main control mechanism. So apparently the Buddhist monks have actually learned to engage the prefrontal cortex uh, to mitigate the effects of the amygdala. So this is, this is when you know, stress management comes in 
and the tools that we can use to manage stress is trying to engage our prefrontal cortex. Okay, and we can, because the brain is actually, it's just like any other muscle. The more you use it, uh, the more you practice, the better you get at it. Okay, it's like riding a bicycle. Right? We, any, anyone in this room ever pick up a bicycle and just go? <laughs> right? No. <laughs> you had to fall, somebody had to hold you, right? And by the time you, you uh, got it, right? Now, has anyone ever ungotten what it's like to ride a bicycle? I think Biden did it one time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to keep politics out of this presentation just for the sake of simplicity, okay? Because otherwise it's going to take a lot longer than an hour. <laughs> right? It's like you, once you get some things, you don't unget them. And that's the same thing with using your prefrontal cortex and, and using stress management tools, okay? It's like meditation, you know. I've, so many times I've asked my patients, oh, do you meditate? Oh, I tried that once. It didn't work. And? Right? So it's the same thing. Once you get it, there's no way you can, you can unget it. And it's just a question of perseverance and stick to itiveness. So, um, and then, uh, you know, just for shits and giggles, there's another diagram of what happens chemically and bio, bio, biochemically in your brain when you have a stressor or the different the different, uh, you know, uh, immune factors, the immune cells, the different, the, the different neurotransmitters, how they start twirling around, you know. It's, it's fascinating, <laughs> right? And then they, 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 these guys sit down and try and figure this all out. But understanding what happens is very helpful. That it's not just like in our imagination. It's not like, oh, I don't know what's going on, right? Because you can understand. Once you, once you know what may be happening, you can actually un, you know, try and understand, and then you can navigate your own stress management and coping skills. Um, we'll move on. This is an interesting graph. It's a stress and performance graph, which actually shows uh, over time, so the more stress is, and performance, how you know, a certain amount of stress is actually good for us. You know, people challenge themselves. They become marathon runners. They, they, you know, they, they become better at something, you know, physically and mentally, right? So at a certain point, you, stress actually increases your performance. But if you're not careful, okay, eventually that performance will decline. So understanding your own limitations and, and setting your own boundaries is really a key to, to having a less stressful and a healthier life, in, in my opinion. Does that make sense? Okay. So, uh, moving on. Um, there's a good quote by Chesterton. Yeah, it says, an adventure is an inconvenience rightly considered. And an inconvenience is an adventure wrongly considered. So, same bunch of words, but a completely different meaning. So it has to do with our perception of how we perceive stress and how we perceive what we can do about it. Okay? So uh, now we're going to move along. Um, all right. So um, we went through the neurophysiology. I'm not going to bore everyone with that. So what is resilience? How do we develop resilience to stress? And the resilience is defined as the ability to adapt successfully in the face of stress and adversity. Yeah? Easier said than done. <laughs> and then capacity and dynamic process of adaptively overcoming stress and adversity while maintaining normal psychological and physical functioning. Because, you know, what we, what we uh, stress, you know, when we are stressed, we call it allostasis. And the more allostasis, the more allostatic stress there is, the, the, the harder it is for our bodies to, to function, okay? So, um, so the mind-body medicine uh, program developed this, um, this formula where stress equals allostatic load and equals vulnerability to illness, okay? Pretty clear, but there are things we can do Okay, 
And these are some of the tools that, that we use in that program. And they can be used interchangeably. You don't have to use them all. You can pick one that's really, that really works for you, right? Like walking in nature. That's a great tool. And if that works for you, you can use that for anything, right? So the relaxation response is what the Benson Henry Institute calls the, the uh, basically the, count, the counter effect to deal with stress. You have the stress response and then you have the relaxation response. And they just called it that because they, they saw what the Buddhist monks' brainwaves were doing and what was happening in their bodies that were meditating. And they said, well, how can we actually get the average Joe, right, to enable us to have, to, to have the relaxation response and to elicit it in our bodies, okay? So um, some of the other stress management tools include mindfulness, okay? Mindfulness is very important. And, and the World Health Organization actually just published a book. It's available online. And it's, uh, it's, it, it, all of this is in there in, in pictures and, and very, very much more digestible. Uh, it's actually a lot of fun. It's a fun book to read. It's in, you, can, you can look that up. Uh, and I, I have a reference here. I, I can give it to you later. So, and mindfulness is just being aware uh, of what's going on in the here and now. Because a lot of times we are so caught up in, in our own heads we're not even there, right? Like sometimes you're driving and like you're not even there driving. It's kind of a form of meditation, but you know, or sometimes somebody may be having a conversation with you, but you're thinking about that appointment or something that happened to you the day before or something you need to do and you completely miss the moment, right? So being mindful requires to slow down. You have to. One of the exercises we, we, we do, actually we shouldn't try that. Hang on. It's a great exercise. So I was a lucky recipient of Marilyn's black raspberries today. So grab one, don't eat it. Okay. I got mean, two. Let's look I got at three. that. I got a one, three. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> No, just don't don't eat it yet. Just grab it. Don't okay. Pass it did you get one? Yeah, I did. I just didn't know. Oh, I'm gonna pass them around. Yeah. Yeah, pass them around. Once you grab it, you don't have to do anything yeah. with it. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll eat it later. Okay. Right. right? So typically. What may happen is you grab one of these, you put it in your mouth, you just chew it up and you swallow it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So right now what we're going to do is we're not going to do that. We're going to just hold it and take a moment to feel it, okay? To feel the texture, to feel its temperature, to feel the little bumps, okay? How, you know, how, how much you can squeeze it, how, you know, right? <laughs> <She's> <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> feel it. And then you know, to take it further. I mean, it, it takes a little time, but then you actually have a whole new sensory experience. Okay, and that's an example of mindfulness. And then you can actually smell it, right? And, and, and it actually does smell really nice, right? So there's another moment that, you know, you would have missed it. You just like popped it in your mouth, right? And then when you're ready, you can just eat it. And if you don't want to eat yours, you can Save give that away. And just, just, but eat it slowly. <laughs> chew it, you know, like let it, let it kind of sit in your mouth and see what the tastes are. And there's probably a few layers of that and the texture, right? So mindful eating actually is one of the tools that we use to, to elicit the relaxation response and to combat stress. How many people do you know that like, oh, I'm going to grab a 10 minute lunch and I'm going to eat it while I'm walking or driving, right? That's just so unhealthy for you, you know, and over time it, 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 it accumulates. The damage accumulates in your body, in your, in, in your mind and in your body. So mindfulness is a very big topic and it's a very powerful tool for stress management. You just have to remind yourself, <laughs> okay? And you know, I, I often sometimes when I catch myself like trying, getting a little overwhelmed with stuff, I just, just 
take a deep breath and say, okay, slow down, you know, just slow down. That's it. And, and it works. So um, cognitive skills. Cognitive skills are important, and it's how we think about stuff, okay? Um, there are, some people just have, you know, a lot of, like, what's called um, limiting beliefs, okay? We're taught, most of us, when we grow up, we're taught things by people who just don't know any better anyway. And they were taught by people that didn't know any better as, as well. So... <laughs> You did? I just pretty much said that to my friend. <laughs> there you go. So, and this creates a set of limiting beliefs, which can be very harmful. Like, you ever catch yourself, you know, like, being in a supermarket and saying, like, why am I always on the longest line? Why is somebody always cutting in front of me in, in, in traffic? You know, like, people tend to think that way sometimes, right? Exactly, I do too. But you know, you live in Vermont, and clearly you have a good, a lot of life's experience. You, you have adapted. But a lot of people do still have, you know, they they have maladaptive behavior. So, um, where's my little notebook? Oh yeah, yeah I, I forget sometimes. <laughs> so what we're we talking about? <laughs> right. So um, yeah. So. So, you know, cognitive reappraisal is something that we, we encourage people to do, is to, is to sometimes say, well, why am I thinking this? Who taught me to think that way? But in order for you to, to be able to do that, you, you actually have to stop yourself for a moment and be mindful and say, whenever you're bothered by some thoughts or by, by like some projections, you know, in your mind that may never even come to fruition, you know, stop for a moment and ask yourself, like, why am I thinking that? Who taught me this? You know, and then you actually come up with some really good answers, sometimes very surprising. Yeah? Okay. So, um, let's, uh, what else? Oh, well, yeah, okay, positive psychology. You know, cultivating positive psychology. Well, you had a perfect example of, uh, you said it. Everything was, you know, as show, and, but people are coming, you know. <laughs> You're finding positive in the midst of chaos. And that's really important uh, for us, you know, because uh, I don't think I would have survived if I, if I haven't found, you know, positives in, in, uh, in, in chaos. And I'll give you just one example from my personal life. I was a first responder at 9-11. And whenever I think about it, it took me a while to get over it. I mean, it, it caused all kind of, all kind of damage on my, on my mind. It took a long time. But now, you know, there is reframing. And when I am reminded of it, it was some event or noise or sound or somebody, you know, I'm thinking, wow, it was actually a beautiful day. It was a beautiful day. And it was, I took my kids to school. It was the first day of school. And it was my, da my daughter's first day in first grade. You know, so you have to kind of like reframe your memories. Okay, so positive psychology, is, is very, very important. And if you can cultivate that, nothing can touch you. Okay? So, uh, yeah, uh, spiritual connectedness is very important. You know, we all need to be connected to something. Uh, and, you know, people that say, I don't believe in anything, you know, that's just like a, such a cop-out because, I mean, you look around you, you put something tiny in the ground, or even if you don't, and then it comes up and it's a beautiful flower. And you didn't do anything. Right? Or, you know, you have a, 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 an egg and a sperm and they come together and you don't, don't, don't have to do anything, then this happens or this happens or that happens or that happens, right? We don't control it. So people that say, oh, you know, I don't believe in anything, that's just, I, I, <laughs> that irks me. That gives me stress. <laughs> you know? So yeah, spiritual, and, and we all can choose to believe in anything we want as long as it resonates with us. You know, like I, I chant, I chant mantras, you know, every day. And that helps me. It's totally not in my culture where I grew up, but you know, I found that it actually very useful. Yeah, I guess this, this is part of mitigation of stress. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people think I'm crazy, but if I'm driving along or walking along the road 
and I smell strong manure in a field, it brings back pleasant memories of when I grew up on my grandmother's farm when I was a kid. And uh, I, I suddenly feel very happy thinking back then. I, I totally get it. And the other day we were driving, I was driving with a friend and we, there was a really strong smell of manure and like, oh my God, that stinks, close the window. I'm like, you know what? I actually like the smell, thinking about what it does and where it comes from, you know, it's like, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> so very similar, yeah. So um, yeah, so uh, exercise and especially mindful exercise is very, very important. Physical movement is life. You know, if we don't move, we just, you know, we weather away and uh, we do become sick because it's, it's important for us to circulate, you know, all the different fluids that we have, the blood, the lymph, the cerebrospinal fluid, you know, all the, all the other things that we need to circulate. And the more we practice that, the, the healthier we stay. There is a, uh, a point of diminishing return. Some people just go at it. You know, some people go to the gym to work off stress and anger. You know, I've seen that so many times. I, I've had people come in with, with, with broken hands because they, they went at a, at, a, at, a, at a heavy bag for, too, you know, too, too heavy. I've seen people, you know, come in with busted discs because they were lifting a weight that was too heavy. You know, so you have to really kind of like understand why you're exercising. You know, and, and, you know, as long as it's good. And find something you enjoy. Like people say, oh, I hate exercise. Well, it's because you haven't found something that you like. And everyone likes different things. Some people like biking. Some people like rowing. Some people like walking. Some people like, you know, whatever. You, you have to kind of follow your interest and, and find something that resonates with you. Okay, and that's a really good stress management tool. Okay, walking is great. And if you ever feel stressed, just go for a walk. It works. You, you all know that, you, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, nutrition. Very, very important. And we just experienced a little taste of nutrition. Of but understanding what you eat is one of the key elements of, of having a, a less stressful life. And, and you, well, you would know, you, you promote, you know, the, the, right? So, uh, but, you know, people, the people used to come see me and, and like they're all stressed, they don't feel well, they have all these problems. Like, are you drinking any water? Yeah, I drink like five cans of Coke a day. Well, the body is not, you know, it's not Coca-Cola, it's water. And you'd be amazed how many people just don't get that or didn't get that until you said, well, do you drink any water? You know, same with food. You know, I mean, if you eat a lot of processed food, it's just your body is not geared to, to process it. You know, it's, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to poison you. So one of the reasons I love living here is you get <laughs> eggs from down the road, you know, you get chickens from and again from down the road, you know, you get beef from down the road, and you have a chance of actually enjoy really wholesome, wholesome eating. And, you know, we really don't need much to, to, to stay healthy and survive. You just need to be mindful about what you put in your system. So, um, sleep hygiene, yeah, that's another really good uh, stress management tool. You know, sleep is really, really important. And like some people, I actually was silly enough when I was younger, say, oh, I'll sleep enough when I die. Totally wrong approach. Okay, you're just going to die sooner <laughs> you know, if you don't sleep. <laughs> you know, so, um, yeah, make sure you get your sleep. You know, and sometimes if you lay there and you can't sleep, just say to yourself, you know what, I'm resting. And the sleep will come. You know, people get stressed about, oh, why am I not asleep at two in the morning? And it's because you're thinking too much, you know? But just slow down and say, okay, my body is resting. I'm just going to lay there and rest. And, and eventually you'll fall asleep. But it's important to get enough sleep, you know? And if you don't during the night, take a nap during the day. Your body will thank you. You know, some people can, some people can't. You know, so um, where were we? Yeah, so uh, here we go. There is the, uh, there is the B8, you know, Bennett and Henry Institute approach to, build, to, to resiliency. So first you build awareness as to how stress can harm us. 
And that's part of this lecture is to say, you know, we, we need to be aware, okay? We just, just all stress, you know? we need to be aware of what, what happens. And then you need to regularly practice your relaxation techniques, whether it's a walk in the woods or whether it's a swim in a lake or whether it's just sitting there you know, with your favorite book or something, but you need to regularly practice it because that's how you get good at something. And that's how your prefrontal cortex learns to actually do the, the top-down thinking, okay? And then you develop an effective thinking and lifestyle choices, as in exercise, as in eating, you know, as in, you know, dealing with other people, okay? Um, so, here we go. So, the SMART program actually uh, says if you want to change something for the better, you have to set some goals, okay? Whether you want to sleep more or eat better or lose weight or, you know, get stronger or, you know, just, be, you know, become, you know, less, less judgmental and, and happier. So, you need to set those goals, right? So, the, the, again, and it's the smart approach. The S is, it has to be specific. What do you want to happen? And journaling is very good, or making yourself little lists, especially in the beginning, that's really, that's really helpful. <laughs> so, um, so what do you want to happen, happen? It helps to focus your effort. You need to kind of have, remember, like, what are you doing? And you, you need to clearly define what it is that you want to do, okay? Because when someone says, oh, I want to lose weight, that, that's just like not, you know, <laughs> that, that's not a goal. That's a wish, okay? And then uh, the M in the SMART stands for measurable. How are you going to measure your progress? You know, you have to kind of like, again, writing things down uh, is very, very helpful. Like some people say, I want to I wanna drink less. I want to drink more water, okay? Or I want to walk more steps. So you measure your progress, you know, every day. And this is when you can see whether you're actually getting closer to your goal or not, okay? Uh, it has to be attainable. If you say to yourself, well, I want to start running and I'm going to run a marathon in two months, well, that's just not, that's just not going to happen, <laughs> no matter how much you want it. It has to be an attainable goal, okay? So really think hard about, you know, what can I do? What is possible for me with my efforts and, you know, my, my facility? that make sense? Okay. And then it has to be relevant. It has to be rele relevant to your life. Like if you say, you know, I want to learn Asian cooking and you're just allergic to peppers, <laughs> that's, just, that's just not going to work. <laughs> right? So you have to think about, is it relevant to, to, to me, like to what I want to do? <laughs> and it, it must be time-based, so that's the T in the SMART. You have to set yourself some time limits. You have to say, by three months from now, by six months from now, by a week from now, this is where I want to be. And then when you monitor your progress and you're mindful, you have a much better chance of actually getting to, to, to do and, and to be the way you want to be. Okay? So, um, we're going to kind of like start summarizing a little bit what we're doing here, okay? So, how do you decrease your stress reactivity? How do Prioritize. Hmm? Prioritize. Prioritize, exactly. What really needs to be done, and then go categorically down the list. Yeah. What should be, what can be bumped off the list. Exactly. Exactly. So, but what you do is you identify your stress warning signs. You have to kind of look at yourself and, and you need to know when you're stressed. Okay, you kind of start, start recognizing like, oh, I'm stressed, I need to do something before it gets out of hand, before you start throwing dishes or, <laughs> or you know, or, or kicking or anything else, or yelling, you know. So, and, and build your stress coping resources as what we talked about, is being mindful, having social connectedness, you know, having, you know, hobby or, you know, that, there's a whole list, right? 
and proactively develop your, your positive cognitions, pleasant emotions, and health-promoting behaviors. Like when you're talking about a stressful day, you started laughing, right? And you know what? There's a whole new topic, <coughs> right, of laughter. There was a, a physician in Mumbai, India. Uh, his name is Dr. Madan Kataria. And some years ago, I think about 25 or 30 years ago, he was a medical doctor, was totally unhappy with, you know, the results he was getting with his patients, you know, not getting like people to improve or get better with the, with the drugs and everything. And he was kind of like a forward thinking kind of guy. And uh, he read this book by Norman Cousins called Anatomy of an Illness. Really, really good book. Uh, so Cousins was a, a, a guy, he was an educator, American educator, in the, I think in the 40s and 50s, who was basically given a death sentence by the medical establishment, an incurable disease. And he's, he was like thinking, well, if negative emotions can make us sick, and we all know that, right? And people die of broken hearts, and falls out and breaks, it's horrible, I've seen it happen. So anyway. <laughs> Uh, then positive emotions can help us heal. And he actually developed this whole movement of what's called laughter yoga today. They have millions of followers worldwide. There's probably close to 10,000 laughter clubs in the world. I used to lead laughter yoga sessions for years. So laughter is very, very healthy. And what happens when you laugh is automatically, even when you start smiling, your body stops making cortisol instantly okay and it produces endorphins okay and it actually produces more killer t cells in your immune system uh, your blood pressure drops i mean you, you get more oxygen it's very cool so laughing is is a really good form of stress management you know and people don't realize that laughter and humor are very different humor is always aimed at something it's 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 always it, sometimes it's derogatory whereas Laughter is, is a pure kind of activity. Yeah. And we're not the only species that laugh, actually. You know, rats will laugh when they're tickled. They, they, they've actually shown that dolphins uh, laugh. You know, uh, apes and monkeys, primates all laugh. Uh, I'm sure birds do. We just haven't figured out the language yet. And uh, so, yeah. And you can just laugh. You know, all you need is to, like, give yourself permission and to express that in a child, you know, without judgment. And you can just laugh like, <laughs> right, start laughing. <laughs> so anyway, so that's one of the positive behaviors. But Norman Cousins, what he did, uh, just to get back to uh, that story, under his doctor's supervision and with his doctor's blessing, he moved into a hotel across the street from the hospital with his doctor. And they watched funny movies, Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, you know, the, the Marx Brothers. And he discovered very quickly that, that, that 20 minutes of laughing allowed him two hours of being pain-free without medication. And uh, on and on this went. And he eventually recovered. He was considered to be a medical miracle. And... Uh, and I personally think it was probably the food that was better in the hotel than the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so laughter is very important. Um, so where are we? Oh, yeah, so um, the relaxation response. These are some of the effects that you're going to experience when you practice the relaxation response. The heart rate slows down, right? Blood pressure lowers, the immune system improves, sense of well-being increases, now, all the opposites of the stress response. <coughs> Sleep improves, brain waves patterns slow down, and digestion improves. So there you have it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, uh, oh, there's some interesting statistics. This is a, a little graph of um, that they had a group of people take the, the training to elicit the relaxation response, right? And uh, they showed that the mortality rates, actually, in the control group 
and people that didn't take the course were about 10.4 percent, whereas the people that did take the course it went, went dropped down to 2.7 percent for a particular population. So that's a very statistically significant finding, if you ask me. That's five times, right? Less. That's the, the SMART program, that's a uh, stress management and resilience training. Where This is where you're taught to elicit the, the relaxation response. You don't have to take that course, you can learn it, you know. Anyway, so um, here's another interesting picture. This shows, um, I don't know if you can see it, yeah, right here. This is a prefrontal cortex, all right, uh, shows activity. And this is a brain of someone who actually has practice the relaxation response, okay, for a while. And so their prefrontal cortex is much thicker and it shows more neural activity, <coughs> which means that the brain is really a muscle. And with practice, you can develop these skills. It's not just, you know, it, it, it's, really, it's really on a cellular level, okay? So um, there we go. So uh, this is basically a summary of what we just discussed and all these different things and how they lead to better resiliency. Um, right, so a couple of more things. So eliciting the relaxation response, okay, or having these positive changes in your body can be done in a number of different ways, okay? And these are different uh, meditative techniques, okay? You can do a breath awareness meditation, which if you, if you like, uh, we can do a, one of those sessions here for a few minutes before we finish, if, if you're so inclined, yeah, okay. Uh, body scan or focusing on your breath is another way to, to do breath or to, med to meditate. Uh, mindful awareness is another way, way to, to meditate. It's part of what we did here with the, with the little berry. Okay, it's just to be mindful. And it's a really cool, like a mindful awareness meditation is where you sit there and you kind of start noticing the sounds around you, like walking in the woods, you know, like the, you, the birds, the rustling of the leaves, the, 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 the whisper of the, of, the, uh, of the stream, you know, and that's very cool. And it's very calming and it's actually really good for you. Uh, yoga is another... Uh, very powerful tool. And uh, has anyone here done yoga? Tai Chi. Yes. Tai Chi. Tai Chi? Yeah. Okay. Tai Chi. Tai Chi or yoga, they're kind of the same, just come from two different cultures. Yes. And the, the, you know, the, the word, like, I, I've asked so many practitioners of yoga, like people come in and, oh, I'm like a certified yoga instructor. And they're like, well, what does the word yoga mean? Yeah. Right? And like, Probably seven out of ten yoga practitioners don't know what the word means in Sanskrit, right? But it actually means to connect, to join. And what's interesting about, you know, the English language is it's actually full of Sanskrit roots because it's part of the Indo-European language, uh, you know, system. So the word yoke, that is what connects the bull to the cart, is, comes from the root yoke. So, and many other words too. It's, it's really cool if you start. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> you know, I always say to people, if you're rushing to a yoga class, you missed it already. <laughs> 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 you know, you got to slow down. <laughs> you know, so practicing yoga is, is, is really a very, very powerful uh, tool to get healthy and to, to reduce stress. Uh, in the United States, unfortunately, you know, what was developed is anti-yoga, you know, with all the commercialism and the, and, the, and the clothing and the this and the that and the other thing and all these different, you know, yoga styles. You know, it's very rare you'll find a, a, true, a true yogic practitioner and a yoga follower uh, these days. I mean, you can find them, but it's, you know, most of these yoga farms are definitely not yoga, if you ask me. <laughs> anyway. Uh, guided imagery. Uh, this is what people do with therapists or, or like guides where, you know, you don't meditate by yourself. And especially it's important when somebody is really struggling. You know, guided imagery is a very powerful form of, of relaxation and meditation where, where somebody will actually guide you through a meditation. 
okay? And, and uh, you can, it, it's, it's, it's powerful, it's good. It also makes it easier, okay? Because you now don't have to really imagine anything. You can listen to what your instructions and just follow them. And guided imagery is very cool. If, if you ever want to like start meditating, go on YouTube, okay? Find a meditation that you think is cool and just, just listen to it, okay? A guided imagery meditation. Um, loving kindness, that's another form of meditation. And this is where you meditate and what you do is you, uh, you kind of get into this really relaxed state of mind, okay? And you just try and send loving kindness to someone you love. You think of someone you love and you kind of like think, give, give them fond thoughts, loving kindness. Then you think of someone you just know, that you might not have any particular feelings for, right? And then you might think of someone who you might dislike and still send them loving kindness. And then you might think of someone you just saw on the street and you don't know at all, you, you care not about who they are. They send them loving kindness. And then the most, the final part of it is sending yourself some loving kindness. Okay, because that's important. We, unless you're willing to be kind to yourself, none of this is relevant. Okay, so, you know, that's why I tell my friends and people, I used to tell my patients, you know, learn to be kind to yourself. Okay, don't beat yourself up in the gym. Don't go out partying till, you know, like three in the morning. Think about your family, you know, that kind of stuff. Be kind to yourself. What is it doing to you? Okay. Um, Contemplation is one of the most powerful forms of meditation, especially when you are confused and you don't know which direction your life is taking you. And when you sit there and contemplate, uh, the answers do come to you. It's a very powerful form of meditation. But in order to get there, you actually have to sit down, be quiet, and, and like let go of a lot of stuff. You know, and then you get the reward. You just can't be attached to it. Oh, I want the answers now. Okay. Being attached to outcomes is one of the worst things in, li in life. It's always a gateway to disappointment. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, and idealized self is another very good form of meditation. Is where you, again, you uh, sit down, you slow your breathing down, you, know, you get into this meditative state, and then you try and imagine, what is my ideal self? What does that look like? You can actually have a conversation with yourself in that state. And that is also a very, very powerful healing tool for yourself. And at the end of it all, you practice any one of those things, you wind up more resilient. You wind up having a happier life, in my experience. You know, and as I said, I've, I've looked for these things and I've come to these things just because of necessity and, and necessity for survival. And it's just, I want to, just wanted to share that with you today. So, before we do this little session of uh, relaxation and meditation, in closing, okay, here's, here's what I suggest we all do. This, this is it, yeah. This, <laughs> this is a cartoon, it says, I bark at everything, you can't go wrong that way. <laughs> Any questions? How long do you spend in meditation? You know, you could do mini meditations, five minutes. You can do 15 minutes. Some people meditate for an hour. You know, it doesn't really matter as long as you're very mindful about why you're doing it and what you want to do. And as you get better at the techniques of getting relaxed faster, for example, all you need is five minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, you really do. I just call it detox. Yeah. Five minute detox. Five minute detox. Yeah. They, they, used to, they started doing these things on NPR uh, recently. It was a one minute uh, meditations. And they'd invite somebody that, that'll just take them through the, you know, the breath awareness. And that was very cool. I think one minute's not enough, but <laughs> well, you need at least like 10 breaths, <laughs> you know. <laughs> When I was a kid, I keep going back to my grandmother's farm, and uh, she would work the heck out of me. I, I had a good work ethic uh, on the farm, and I was only baby between uh, eight and ten years old. 
But one of my favorite things to do was to walk into a field and lie down in the grass. And when you first lie down in the grass, it's very quiet. And after a while, uh, the crickets and all that, and the grasshoppers, you know, they stop moving. But my favorite thing was just to look up at the sky and watch the clouds in the sky of blue and see it transforming into goblins and submarines and things like that. And occasionally I would just fall asleep. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you get five minutes or so. Yeah, you get relaxed enough. Your yeah. body says, okay, I'm lights out. I'm just going into like dream world, which is also very healthy. So any more questions? Yes. I have a question. So you have situational things, like you don't necessarily have every you know, constant stress, but there's specific situations that stress you out. Would you try to work on those situations, or would you just start practicing all these things, kind of like if your body's not healthy, well then you do all the healthy things, and even if you can't diagnose that one issue, it's all going to help make that better. So would you approach it that way, or would you try to hone in and figure out why those things are that particular situation stressing you out, and work on it? Well, I, build skills? I would probably do both. You know, you, 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 building skills is, is essential, okay? Without that, you know, you can't change anything. And sometimes when you build skills, you actually come up with answers how to change a situation. And if you can't change a situation, and if it's really toxic for you, sometimes there's either radical acceptance or radical forgiveness, or you just walk away. You know, that's the, because otherwise you wind up, you know, poisoning yourself and resenting, you know. Forgiveness is very, very important. And, and forgiving yourself is the first thing you need to do. Sometimes you need to forgive yourself for being angry at something or someone. Then you can forgive them. It took me years, like my mother drank herself to death, for example, right? It was very sad. And for years I was so mad and it really bothered me and, and it actually made me sick. But you know what, I forgave her because she didn't know any better and I couldn't control it, you know? And I'd have to forgive. And you know, it was like a big weight lifted off my shoulders. Like, I, it was not my fault, I, I forgave her, you know? So things like that, you know, you, you, but, but you have to work on yourself, okay? First and foremost, before you can work on anything else. And just build those skills little by little. Yeah? It doesn't have to be done overnight. You know, but pick something that you think, oh, I'd like to try this and keep trying and trying. And then when you've mastered it, you go, oh, let's try this too, you know. And that's how it works. Any more questions? Okay, so I, if, you, if you like to, I, we could do a little meditation, uh, maybe like 10 minutes or so. If you're so inclined, I'll give you an example of what, uh, how these things kind of work. So, um, there we go. So, sit down comfortably, okay, in, in your chairs, okay, and kind of, you can close your eyes or you don't have to close your eyes. I think closing our eyes is helpful because it kind of helps us tune in and tune out some of the things that may be distracting, but it's not necessary, okay? And just kind of feel the weight of your body on the chair that you're sitting in for a moment. And feel your feet touching the floor and the floor supporting your feet. And the back of the chair supporting your spine and supporting your weight. And take a nice deep breath and notice the air coming in through your nose and slowly coming out through your nose or your mouth. And just notice the process of the air coming in and the air going out. And realize that you are being breathed by your body. You do not need to control this process. You just need to let it be. But observe how the body is taking in air and how it comes out. 
is a breath in and a breath out. And just allow yourself to observe the breathing for a few minutes. And we're going to take 10 deep breaths. And in your mind, silently count from 10 to 1. With each inhalation, you'll say the number going downwards. And with each exhalation, you will allow your body to release any stress that you may be feeling, any tension. There is nothing else you need to do, nowhere else you need to be right now. Allow your body to breathe, and with every exhalation, you're becoming more and more comfortable, and more and more at ease. And now, when you've gotten to one, focus your attention on your big toes. And imagine that they're made of atoms. And there is empty space in between the atoms. And with each breath, and your toes are becoming lighter, and freer. And then focus your attention on the arch of your feet. And that too is made of atoms. And with each breath, they become more and more calm and more relaxed and more spacious. And with each breath in, all the obstacles to relaxation melt away. And with each exhalation, you're becoming more and more at ease and comfortable. And now focus your attention on your ankles. And they're also made of atoms. And with each exhalation, your ankles are becoming lighter and more comfortable. And now, focus your attention on your calves and your knees and the space behind the knees. And all of that is also made of atoms and the space between the atoms. And with each exhalation, it's becoming more comfortable, more relaxed. And next, focus your attention on your thighs, the front, the back, the side of the thighs, and the hips. And with each exhalation, the space between the atoms in your cells becomes lighter and lighter and more comfortable. And you may hear some noises and sensations. Let them pass without judgment and focus on the breath every time you are distracted. As the air comes in, and the air flows out. And now focus your attention on your pelvis, the back, the front, the lower back. And with each exhalation, they become lighter and more comfortable. 
and more at ease. And now continue focusing your attention on your breathing and visualize your spine and your tummy as they are also made of atoms. And with each exhalation, the space between the atoms becomes lighter and more comfortable. And as you exhale each time, the spaces between the vertebrae become more open and more spacious and more comfortable. And with each exhalation, you are more and more at ease and more comfortable. And now, focus your attention on your chest and your rib cage as it gently expands when you breathe in and gently contracts as the air goes out. And with each breath, your lungs and chest become lighter and more comfortable. And now focus your attention on your hands, your forearms, elbows, and shoulders, and your shoulder blades. And with each exhalation, the space between the atoms becomes lighter and more spacious. With each exhalation, you're becoming more <clears throat> and more relaxed. Remembering there is nowhere else you need to be right now and nothing else you need to do. Allow yourself the space to observe your breathing and relax your body. And focus your attention on your neck, your throat, the back of your throat. And imagine an inner smile generating in the back of your throat and the space between the atoms becoming wider and lighter and more comfortable. <clears throat> and now, focus your attention on your cheekbones, your jaw, your lips, your nose, your forehead. And with each exhalation, the space between the atoms becomes more comfortable and light. And now, focus your attention on the top of your head, your ears, the back of your head, the scalp, and allow all the space between the atoms to become light and expand. In a few moments, We'll start counting from three to one. But until we do, take a moment to feel the sense of peace and relaxation that you are experiencing right now. Some people might say, I am happy. Some people might say, I am relaxed. Some people might say, I am whole. And some people might say, I am enough. Take a moment to just be there and remember this feeling going forward. And next time you feel something that may be irritating in your life. Remember this feeling 
and take a deep breath and allow your body to just be. So three, you're slowly starting to hear the noises around you and starting to feel the things in your body and the chair and the floor. Two, and you might want to say, when I open my eyes, I will smile and feel happy. One. <laughs> well, welcome back. How was it? Yeah. So that's just a basic breath awareness kind of body scan meditation that you can do, you know, uh, anywhere, anytime. You know, it's just, but focusing on the breath is really the key to any type of meditative practice, you know, and allowing yourself not to control it, but to observe it. And you know, the monkey brain's gonna do all kinds of stuff. Every, every time you catch yourself not focused on your breath, just refocus. And over time, it just becomes easier and easier. All right? Okay. Great. Unless you have any more questions, we're done. Thank you for so today. much. You're welcome. Great lecture. All right.